We at DBS obviously super lucky to welcome basically one of hip hop's biggest luminaries. <laughs> basically like kind of you the young you growing up where you grew up and what it was that brought you to music um growing up uh well i guess based on the history of what we've been taught hip hop started in 1973 i was able to conceive it around 76 my first introduction was 1976 to a set of turntables not quite this elaborate <laughs> but yeah um 76 i was introduced to the turntables um they were um they were techniques but they were like b1s and d2s around that time not 1200s they, for DJ as such. they, they were for djing but not for what DJing has evolved to. Um, it was the beginning stages of trying to get it to the point of where it is now, where you have pretty much a skipless program when you DJ, you know. But um, there was back in the day when we used to have to put a penny or a nickel or something just to balance, balance the cartridge on the, yeah. on the needle, on the record. Yeah, I put pennies on my first. You know. <laughs> so, so it was behind like um, uncles. Uh, my behind my uncles and my 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 um my sister, my sister's boyfriend, you know um, my cousins. I grew up in Brooklyn, uh, right up until 1984. I lived in Brooklyn, so living in the boroughs, DJing was a major part of our culture in the boroughs. And then I moved to Long Island in 1984 is when I met the rest of these guys. Yeah. So. I sort of touched on this already, so that was the first gear you had DJ. What was the first time you had sampling gear? Sampling gear? To make, make your own music. What was the first, the first sampling gear was a cassette deck with a pause button. Yes. <laughs> that was the first stages of producing. <laughs> When it came down when it came down to sampling, the first stages of it was a pause tape. Yeah trying to uh, spend hours and hours of catching that little one second or half a second break and looping it up and catching other parts of it to make, to actually arrange, rearrange the record to make your own song. Yeah. When you started out doing this, you did this for fun, I assume. When did you think, hang on, I could do this and start making some money from it? Um, I didn't think about money until I was in high school. Um, prior to that, it was just a lot of fun. It was something that was a major part of my childhood. Anytime there was a birthday, any kind of festivity, a uh, block party, whatever we could have a party for, the turntables would come out. A beautiful sunny day, nobody got shot, let's have a party. <laughs> wow. <laughs> could you tell us about the first time you came across one of your musical heroes in the early stages? I have a few of those heroes. Um, my first hero I could say I truly came across was probably Prince Mark E.D. from the Fat Boys. Um, just to know that he was accessible. He was reachable, you know. I mean, the Fat Boys was just as big as Run DMC at one time. And I mean, let alone, at one point was bigger than Run DMC. Um, but, um, to go to, um an event of their movie, Disorderlies, 
And to know as big as he were, he was warm welcoming and open. I thought it was so hip hop. He embraced me like I was from his neighborhood. So Prince Marky D was one of the first I came across. As time went along, I got to meet so many great people even before I got into the music business. Biz Marky used to come up to our high school all the time. Um, obviously Prince Paul, um, Kooji Rap, you know, Kooji Rap and Polo. Um, Polo had some family that lived on Long Island. So they used to come to a lot of parties that I used to do in Long Island. And here it is. I never knew them at the time, but they used to show, at, show up at all these parties. You know, so running into these guys, you know, especially when they had records on the radio around that time. And what, what people fail to realize, hip hop was really that special to us back then because we only got it on the weekends. You guys get it like every day of the week, every minute, every hour, every second of your lives. We only had the opportunity to get it on Friday and Saturday and maybe a late night Sunday or Monday show, you know. So it was something that we, one, on the weekday we had to sneak and listen to, and on the weekend really be, throughout the week, really get prepared for our extravaganza, which is hip hop for Friday and Saturday night. So, you know, um, for it to be that special back then, I mean, Just Ice was another one that I met as well. Um, but for it to be that special back then, you know, even now it's still very special, but back then it was like, it was so far of a reach. It was such of a dream yeah. back then. So when you when you saw these people, they were highly revered, you know, just based on just the one or two records they had on the radio. You know, when it came down to, you know, New York, we're talking about still the first decade of hip hop, and um, it's still not really reaching past New York in a lot of respects. You know, maybe a couple of sprinkles through England, a couple of sprinkles here and there, but. Most of, for the most part, not really succeeding past New York, you know. So yeah, these were our local heroes. I definitely played on someone else's decks for a very long time. <laughs> um, I got my first DJ mixer when I was nine. And then um, there was these component stereos that, you know, you had the receiver and the record player. That's when it was called a record player then. Um, you had the, the, the long prong in the middle and the, the click on the side to lift up the arm and yeah, yeah. Actually we converted those into turntables with the DJ mixer. And we had to learn how to mix on those by just using um You had to really touch it real soft and we utilized um the plastic bag from the Chinese restaurant. That was for that was that that was that had the grease in it from fried chicken, so you can actually slide your records back. <laughs> so it was this plastic bag that used to have for fried chicken, in the Chinese restaurant. We would use that as a slip slip mat, so, so it could slide back along with another record. Under that as well. Just for people that don't know, it's like to, so you can so the record flies better. Yeah, it was like slip mats before slip mats, you know. Yeah. So you can actually backspin the record, let alone be able to kind of control it because there was no pitch control at that time. So just a big old rubber. Like yeah, big, big old rubber plate. plate. That was it. Yeah, <laughs> and we would take that off to put the the um put the fried chicken mat on, <laughs> and you had to thumb it throughout the record so you can blend two records together because there was no pick and pitch control at the time. Well, it was definitely about working with what you had at the time, you know, coming from humble beginnings and enjoying something so much that you're just going to figure it out, you know. These were, these were our toys back then. So, you know, once you had a love or a passion for something, if it was drawing or whatever, like you just spent hours and hours doing it. So it didn't, I, I, I guess I never quite realized I was practicing because I just, I just woke up and loved doing it, you know, all day long, you know. So for the most part, it was just, DJ was like my first love. Spot on, great. So we're going to ask you to do a little demo now, some of these DJ skills. Sorry? We're going to ask you to do a little demo. 
now <laughs> of some of this. I, will, I kind of want to talk about and have a little look at some juggling because that's kind of tell us about tell us about juggling. Okay, um, juggling played a big part of the the battle scene. Yeah. I don't come from that scene, no. but um, it's something I do like to partake in with party rocking. Um, it's always feels good to know that when you could play a song that everybody knows pretty well and you could kind of manipulate it in the mix, keeping the groove while the people are dancing, but being able to bounce the rhythm in a different format from what people are used to hearing, you know? So that's always been the beauty to beat juggling, even down to scratching. Scratching in my format always were, was really advantageous when we made records. It would always be like a chorus part something that would signature the lyrics when the MC is rapping, something that would um, come from maybe another hip hop record that would lend to the concept of whatever song we would make with our own records. So that was, you know, something that was like very viable when it came to scratching as well, you know. Yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Let's see what's up. Thanks, I appreciate that. <laughs> I know what you're saying, though. You're saying you're a party, party right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, the that's the element I truly grew up on, you know. Um, Days of Van Bada, you know, Flash, you know, those elements of block parties, you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I, I, I like the idea of, I like the battle. I think the, um, the competitive edge of it is awesome, yeah. you know? But I think you can only get like a good 20 minutes out of your program with that. Yeah. Then it's about a party that gotta continue for the next few hours. And one thing I learned about scratching, 
you can't do too much of it. The girls will leave. <laughs> Then you got a room full of guys and it doesn't look too cool, you know. What I mean? <laughs> so, um, I mean, you kind of answered that question. I was going to say, what, what, what is DJing to you? You kind of, kind of answered that with that question. Um, how have you learned yet? Um, so, actually, yeah, so moving on from that, describe, you're talking party rocking, DJing, or juggling in there. How does the relationship with the MC come into that? Well, from from my era, our era, um, yeah. <laughs> we're the ultimate maestro. We set the tone for the MC to come out to do what he needs to do. We it's our job to get this energy going in the room before that guy touched the mic. This already should be like a a, a a a vibe in the air already. You know that builds up this anticipation and excitement for the MCs to come along, you know. Um, yeah, we're the first on and the last to leave. <laughs> Our job is very difficult because we have to, you know, we have to get it cracking. We have to get it, we have to get the, the crowd up and jumping well before these guys touch the mic, you know. If you don't set that tone, then it's gonna be a pretty difficult show, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's what I come from. So I carry that on wherever I go. That's like a natural part of how I just play. Um, it it's, it's definitely has, has evolved along with the music evolving, you know, along with time just changing. But the basic essence of party rocking never changes, you know. You know how it has to be done from the time the people walk in the door to the time it hits the peak of the night, which is about midnight and how you gotta close out that night. So, here it is. There's a major relationship between the DJ, the audience, and the owner of the club. <laughs> you know, because he brings us in for a certain reason, and that's to keep these people dancing, and let alone keep them thirsty, you know? And, uh, and that's, and when a, a DJ can actually do that, he's a great DJ, he's doing a good job. <laughs> you want to stay ahead of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that leads on quite nice, actually. So, what's the difference between rocking a party and you're, now you're a DJ behind an MC group playing live shows? It's the same element. Um, it would be advantageous to a lot of DJs who DJ for a group to implement the same vibe of party rocking. All you do is just, all you did was bring two guys to the program to, to actually, um, to actually, w what we do on record, create the illusion of the artist being there when we actually DJing, you know, to the crowd. It kind of gives them a mini concert feel if you play in the right way, you know. Um, you want to take them on this, this pretty much this ride, this roller coaster ride, and all you're doing is adding one or two guys to the mix to fill in what is actually our record. Let's take the vocal off the record and just play the music and bring these guys out to do it live, you know? But it goes into the continuity of the performance and how we interact in a, with one another and how we interact with the audience. You know, the more, you, th there's more of a dynamics of it now when you bring these guys to the stage and it's definitely about engaging the audience a little bit more as opposed to just playing records for people to dance. It's getting them involved in the show. Sorry? A bit of a link then between the audience and yeah, the DJ? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's always a link between the audience and the DJ because they, ne they, they, the they need the music to get to get going. But when it's time for the performance now, there's an anticipation and excitement for something a little bit more than just us, you know, dan me playing music and them dancing. Now it's time to engage in the overall activity, you know, 
which is crowd participation, throw your hands in the air, playing the songs that they know the lyrics to so they can sing along with the group, you know. You know, it's a couple of things that play a part of, you know, the overall excitement of the performance. Of course, great. Um, so, I know you said you don't do too much. Can we just have a little chat about scratching, though? And what you, I mean, you've always said, don't, don't, we're not going to do it for too long, otherwise all the girls are going to leave. But <laughs> <laughs> can we just see some... Um, do, you, do you have any, let me see. a go-to scratch you like to do? Uh, a lot of times when I'm scratching, I don't really scratch in a party. Not as fluent as the battle DJ. Yeah. Um, I scratch mostly on records that I'm making. When I'm producing a track, yeah. you know, something that might have some cohesiveness and conceptual, some concept to the to the song that's actually being created. Like, um, for instance, um, Me, Myself, and I. Yeah. You know, those scratches make sense to the song, you know. To actually do a bunch of scratching in the party, to be honest, it's irritating. It's completely irritating. Like, you hear people say all the time, why don't you just let the record play? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's not really conducive to party rocking. It's definitely conducive to battling, yeah. you know, when you're trying to go up against another competitor, yeah. you know. And like I said, that's like 20 minutes of your program. That goes along with the juggling. The juggling is part of scratching, yeah. you know, when you're backing up the records. and. So, like, I mean, someone like... You know, someone who's a perfect example of what you're saying, it's like Primo. Like he doesn't really, he's not a scratcher, but his, all his tracks have this kind of scratch chorus. Yeah, he's pretty much the same as I. Yeah. Um, more so conceptual to the songs that yeah. we produce. Um, someone who's more fluent in the scene, on the stage, I would say somebody like, um, um, uh, DJ Craze. Someone like him, or even um, Boogie Blind. Yeah. Um, I don't know if y'all familiar with these DJs that I'm mentioning. Um, Craze is from Miami. He's one of the most incredible battle DJs I ever encountered in my life. You know, um, you know, he's completely bonkers with what he does. Um, you might want to Google him up. You know, um, I'm trying to think. DJ Revolution. He's another. You know. Um, a track, I believe, has the, in my opinion, has the best of both worlds. You know, he definitely come, from, he come from the, he come from the battle scene, but he's a very relevant party DJ. And when he does his parties, there's not much scratching going on, not at all. Well, uh, J Jazzy Jeff as well. Like I saw him when I saw him. I, I saw, I got Another of, great example. I got, I got, I had the pleasure of supporting him when he came to Bristol, and he was the best. Now he's the best. He's the best the example. Party. He's the best example. Yeah. He, he's the complete best example of what I've been trying to describe. Yeah. Now he has the best of both worlds. You know, he comes from the battle element. He was world supremacy in what 1986. Yeah. You know, no one could ever take his crown. And he does all the parties from underground hip hop to Las Vegas. You know, I. Uh, He's one of the DJs I would say has um, a broad spectrum of music and party rocking on every level, from the underground to the reggae scene to the pop scene to even taking it to I don't know folk music as well. Like you know, I've I recently received a, a music collection from J Jeff that was beyond belief. Really? You know? Oh, wow. I couldn't understand why. Um, Based on the collection he gave me, I couldn't understand why he wasn't doing more producing, more hip hop production. Yeah. But when I see him play, you could tell DJing is truly like his main love. You know, like he he's he's the Picasso mm -hmm. when it comes to the art of DJing. Yeah. Ultimately, I agree, man. I agree yeah. totally. Um, great. Okay, I'm not gonna make you scratch then after that. <laughs> <laughs> No way. Um, so, so, tell us about how you met up with the rest of De La Soul. Um, 1984, I moved to Amityville, Long Island from Brooklyn. We actually met in summer school. <laughs> we were all failed. How couple, old were we? How old failed were we? a couple of classes. I was, I was 14. Posh was 15. 
Dave was 16, you know. Um, but we all met in summer school. It was a mutual friend that we all had uh, at the time who I was DJing with around that time. And based on our friendship, he brought us all together. Um, and um, we were secretly, secretively working on music. I mean, we got together, 84, some of, actually it was summer of 85, we got together, but things didn't start really materializing until like 86. You know, we were fumbling around with some things, but it got a little more serious in 86. Concepts of like Three's a Magic Number came together, Daisy Age came together, um, even songs that never even made the record. Um, but other records, Potholes in My Lawn came together. Um, try to think, Ghetto Thing around that time came together. Um, it wasn't, the hit records didn't really come until like a lot of part of the recording process. But, Some of those ones you mentioned. But these were, these were ideas we were on since we were like 80, in 86. I was 16 at the time. And um, it was all like double cassette before we even got our first four track. Um, a foot pedal sampler, a guitar pedal that had, had, a, uh, had the capabilities of sampling about eight seconds worth of music. And you would get more if you actually sped the record up really fast, you know. So um, we had, um, I had a sequential time. I was like, Paul was like, Paul was like the crash test dummy to this equipment. Paul is in Prince, Prince Paul. Prince, Prince Paul, Paul yeah, yeah. yeah. He was like the crash test dummy, crash test dummy when it came to equipment. Some people here might not know that name. Like, can you just break down Prince Paul? And, Prince we, Paul is him? the person that you know he can, you could say is responsible for De La Soul. Um, he was in a group called Stetsasonic in the early '80s who used to tour with Run DMC and uh, Houdini and EPMD and so many legendary great rappers. Um, but he uh, broke off from that to produce us for the most part. And I'm, Paul is actually from our neighborhood. He's from Amityville, Long Island. And you know we had a connection behind a mutual friend Actually, he and I getting involved with a mutual friend working on another song that was completely horrible. It was the wackest record I can ever participate in. And we both had this mutual feeling. And then we end up playing some demos for one another. I end up playing some demos for him. Well, he ended up playing some, some stuff for me for the Stetsasonic third album. Yeah. Stet third album, which was called, um, uh, what was it, Info Gear? No, it was the second album. In Full Gear was the second album. And um, there were some things that were going on. There were some things that he wanted to put on the album that didn't make the album. And he was frustrated with it. But it was so in alliance with what we were doing. So that's where our relationship began to develop even more. Because when he played it for me, I was like, yo, this stuff is incredible. I don't know why y'all not doing this. <laughs> and then I was like, yo, I really need to play you some stuff. And I ended up playing him like, the demo of Plug Tune In, the demo of Potholes, the demo of Daisy Age, um, the demo of, um, you know, the intro, I forgot the name of the intro on Stakes is High. Okay, yeah. That was done back then. Huh. The intro that we got for Stakes is High was what? done back when we did Three Feet High and Rising. Huh. So I played him a bunch of this stuff that was um, a lot of it, a lot of production done by us collectively, you know, Myself, Paz, and Dave, and um, Paul really thought it was incredible, like something he could be a part of. And I could truly say Prince Paul didn't make any promises. He just said, we're going to take this stuff to the studio, and we're going to clean this up. We're going to come from four track to 24 track, and we're going to really work in the studio. And I got my true studio experience by working with Prince Paul. Right. I mean, I guess a lot, not, not a lot of people would have the opportunity to get inside the studio. Is that... Sorry? I guess a lot of people wouldn't have that opportunity to even get inside a studio. I mean, it's I had, quite I had expensive. Many, I had many opportunities to go to the studio before, but I couldn't touch anything. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of R&B guys at that time, you know, that wouldn't allow you to really touch the equipment. Right. Prince Paul allowed us to touch the equipment, get familiar with the equipment. 
You know, there was already certain things that we were doing at home that we just needed the the devices that were in the studio to clean up our sound. Yeah. So behind getting in the studio with Paul, I got to learn how to one enhance my my production skills behind the equipment that's in front of me. Let alone, um, I stumbled on becoming an engineer behind you know my time in the studio yeah. and learning all the different equipment and I and at certain times not really needing an engineer for certain things that I needed to get done. So what when when you when you took these raw demos into the studio like what what bits survived and then what did you add like in the studio? So if you what bits of the original demos are still there in the final recording? Well, like, is it like a samples there, or did you like change the drums? Did you? Is it just a case of running it through all the the gear they had? Well, one thing I can say about our creative process, it was always a situation where whether someone can see it or not, let's just just let's just see it through, no matter what, you know. So if somebody had an idea. And say like if Dave had an idea and I felt like it was whack. But I could feel too premature about that, you know. Here it is, you know, I, I may not quite see it in the beginning. So the out of respect of the idea, let's just see it through to the very end. You know, everybody do their best to make it a good song, regardless of how you personally feel about it, you know. And then there's been many times I... I've been, in the end, like, wow, this song is incredible. I didn't think this would come out that way. I didn't, I didn't hear the beat this way, you know, and vice versa for everyone else, you know. So I think it's all about first respecting the idea yeah. and then seeing it through. And then, of course, as you go through the process, of course, there's some things you may add. You go, mm, that's whack. Let's mute that. Let's erase that, you know. Yeah. You know, and then, and then here it is even... Later in some songs, like here it is, me, myself, and I, it came more to a completion as we got closer to mastering the record. So we had recorded it one way, but the more we had listened to it over and over and over and over, and mind you, everybody's going, hmm, sounds good, but I think there's something missing. Something's missing, something's missing. The, the, the one sample is too repetitious. So... Poss would go back and listen to the original record of where we sampled it from and call me up and be like, Mace, I think we should catch this part. We should catch this part for the vocal. Right. This part is great for the chorus and everything else, the bridge and everything else, but let's catch this part for the vocal. Right, right. And we go back in the studio and we put it in there and actually, and it works, you know? It's, you know so it's just, you know, it's just seeing respecting the idea of an individual and seeing it through trying it don't you know honestly don't cancel it out until you actually try it you know and a lot of times I think that's big I think that's real big advice man to be honest well I, I, that came from Paul honestly I, would, I, really? I can't I can't take credit for that I think that came from Paul and I believe it came in a way of because he didn't quite have that with his own group you know Right, because he, uh, he, he, he came up with sort of mad ideas. Yeah. And they've been thrown out. And it's completely thrown out. Yeah. You know, he's a, he was in a six-man group. So that could be pretty stifling at times when everybody has ideas, everybody in the group is a producer, a writer, you know. And Prince Paul is sort of, well, from my point of view anyway, is kind of got a mad idea about things like arrangement and the way he makes tunes, if you listen to his production against maybe more standard like hip hop, it's, it's got a different style to it, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, Paul has a very comedic style, um, really gory at times. Yeah, like grave diggers. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think um, you can pretty much tell what what's missed in Dela's work after we worked with Paul? A lot of it is probably the majority of it is the humor, 
I think we still implement our natural humor to it, but it would be super saturated with Paul. I think um, we would also have a little bit more quirkiness in our music. You know, um, you can um, you can totally identify with the records Paul did for De La Soul. Um, tracks like um, Millie Pull a Pistol on Santa. That's definitely Paul. Um, three Days Later. Yeah. That's definitely Paul with a little twist from everybody involvement, but that's definitely Paul. Um, even um, I Am I Be, that's Paul, okay. you know? You know, so this 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 production that's from Paul that's very eccentric, real really eclectic, yeah. in my opinion. That kind of leads me on something I was going to talk about here is the 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 skin, the skit, the skit, the skit, the invention of I the mean, skit. You know, just talk to us about that a little bit. Like I said, the the skit was honestly our thing. You know, Paul tends to get a lot of credit for it. You know, he he kept enforcing it. But really, that was our thing. Um, Let's break down what it is, though. Some people the, don't the know skits, what a skit is. The skits are the little, little silly interludes in between each song that um, some, may, some mean something, some don't mean anything. Some are just, just really stupid, you know. Um, just us being kids or... I remember listening. That's kind of one of my or, first or, ever listened to or, it. Even at grown men, think. even as grown men, we were doing the same thing, like really just <laughs> tapping into our inner child and at four or five in the morning and doing something real silly on a record like Ghost Weeds on, yeah, yeah. you know. So we still always implement, implemented the idea of the skits because we, we did start it. But I think with Paul's involvement, it would go to the next level, you know, you know, doing st stuff like um, moaning and groaning like we having sex on a song, you know, you know, stuff like that. And nobody's really having sex in the studio, but doing <laughs> stuff like that, you know, um, whispering on a record, we were the first to do stuff like that, you know. Um, just real quirky, silly stuff, man. It really gave something to that album. I, that's, I, it really gave something to that album. Yeah, that's I mean, kind of I, I think it gave, it, it showed vulnerability, um, innocence, you know, that you could, like, you know, for what is perceived to be in hip hop with this big bravado and everybody, this macho ness, that you see three guys who are really like being carefree and silly, you know. Not to say that anybody's soft or no punk like that, but everybody has a silly side to them. Yeah. I, I, it, it, was, it was all about definitely expressing every emotion as a human being. And Paul was the epitome of that. You know, like, whatever you feel, put it in a record, you know? And I think we did just that, you know? That was, that was, a, that was some great guidance from him, you know? Not to, not to have any, um, not to have any boundaries, not to have any limits, you know? Just lessen your inhibitions and let it go, let it fly. That's good, something I was gonna say was, so, cause you guys, did come, I mean, I remember it this, in England. You know, I'm in England watching MTV and me, myself, and I come on and it's like, this is different straight away. That was what come across straight away, it's different. <laughs> it's something fun about it. And, you know, that's, and that sort of went on in England. So is, were you kind of deliberately putting that across? Like saying, look, we're different, we're, we're a different kind of hip hop crew. Was that your idea? Um, it was important to be different. I mean, for that era in time, it was all about originality, you know. Uh, coming up under the umbrella of what we call hip hop, there, it was important to be diverse within the culture and the genre. It, you know, what made you stand out from the rest is that you did what you did well and it spoke to the culture still, no matter what. Like, much as I love Rakim, I don't want to make a record that sounds like Rakim. You know, much as I love Run DMC, I don't want to make a record that sounds like Run DMC. There's, there's things that they're doing that are inspiring me, inspiring me wholeheartedly to do what I want to do. Um, I mean, here it is, what made us take it even to the next level. I mean, I think we were all influenced by Run DMC by knowing that whatever they wore on the street is what they wore on stage, you know? So I think those images alone was awesome, you know? 
uh, what took it to the next level for me was a group like Ultra Magnetic. Right. You know, with the lyrical wordplay yeah. and the styles and the concepts and the beats and things like that they were using. So here it is. It was cool to be inspired, but not to make records like these people, especially when you look in to get the respect of these people. I don't want to sound like them. I don't want to be the one to go, hey, he's trying to sound like me, you know? That's whack. That's biting. Yeah. That is something that happens in today's hip hop. Like, that's okay today. I, I mean, it's odd for that to be, but apparently that's okay today. That's been okay for some time. But coming from the era, I mean, you know, not to toot our own horns, but reason why they classify us what they classify us as legends or whatever these days is because we have our own signature sound you know you can actually tell when somebody's trying to make a record like me you can tell when somebody's trying to make a record like chuck d yeah. you could tell when somebody's trying to make a record like rock him you can actually literally tell you know yeah. so that's what separate the real from the fake the the people who Stand the test of time next to the people who are just one hit wonders. For real, man. Spot on. Um, so, on a, on a production tip, man, um, who you've said, you mentioned a few. I, I just wanted to ask because I know you obviously worked with them. Um, it was like uh, Dilla. Yeah. I just want to ask a little bit about him and how he obviously influenced you and what, how work, what working with him was like. One of the coolest, coolest, coolest people in whoever touched this business, most, one of the most humble souls with all the talent that he possessed, you know. Um, he was somebody that, he was highly influenced by everything we did, but then turned around and influenced us. Like, became very influ influential to us. Like, you know, in this genre of music, they predict every artist to have three albums. After your third album, your career is over. You know? Um, and when you reach that plateau, you can begin to feel weary. You know, you could go, wow, is it over? You know? Yeah. You begin to doubt yourself. You begin to question yourself. These are normal human instincts, you know? Especially when there's um, certain parts of the industry you gravitate to at a cer certain point in time that you look to help sustain what you have. But when they fall out of love with what you have, then what do you rely on, you know? And I can say a, the blessing for us has always been um, embracing the new talent and embracing people like Dilla and embracing people like Truth E No Lie, Shorty No Mask, but Dilla most most of all, he brought a lot to the table, you know. More than just his music, he brought his love and he brought his inspiration. You know, like, what, you crazy? Like, we still could do this. Like, and he talking we, like, you know, and here it is, he's just brought into the fold, but he talking we, like, I've been a part of this before y'all even let me in, kind of deal, you know? Yeah. So that's inspiration just to kind of, to keep going, you yeah. know? And then somebody who's looked to deliver for you, like, you know, he has a particular sound for him and his group, Slum Village. But when he can turn around as a true musician, true pro producer, and deliver something that totally signatures Dayla, something that totally signatures Tribe, something that totally signatures Janet Jackson, yeah. you know? Because he has done that. Yeah. I don't know if y'all know, but he produced a very big hit record for Janet Jackson. Um, the, the Joni Mitchell sample, there you go. So that's very huge classic, very huge classic. Um, so, you know, for him to, 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 to engross himself in your sound and passionately deliver, you know, yeah. you know, that's inspiration, man. That's true inspiration. Yeah, man. So on, on, he leads quite nicely into digging. Sorry? He leads quite nicely into digging. Digging for records. Yes. Obviously, you, you enjoy digging for records as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Can you give us a, a little, little talk about that and what, I, I, how, 
Um, digging is almost like a crack habit. <laughs> <laughs> um, most DJs, we got it really bad, you know. <laughs> we travel, we travel the globe. I think we spend more money on records than we do clothes. I mean, I've been wearing a black tee for 20 years. <laughs> So between records and, yeah, technology and all of that, yeah, a lot of my money has gone into that. Okay, well, getting nearer the end, so we want to just quick little bit about the modern day. So it seems you talked about technology there. Like, how do you think that's sort of changed the game? Like, is um, it definitely has evolved. Um, I mean, to gain something, we definitely lose something all the time. Um, I just always just say, you know, for you guys out there who just embarking upon all of this and technology has evolved, you know, definitely go back and do your history on what came before all of this, you know. Go and look at the turntables, you know. I mean, Google is right at your fingertips, right here in this room. So, you know, just go back and at least read up on some of this stuff. I think you'll have a better appreciation of what you're trying to do if you know where it comes from, you know. A lot of people are getting into this with bad intentions. Everybody think it's, everybody truly think these three pieces are a quick money maker. You yeah. still gotta have talent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still gotta have talent and you still gotta have love and passion. You know, and the, and a big part about having love and passion is just having information as well, you know. I think we're having the information, you'll develop the respect. Damn right, man. Okay, right, we need to wrap up. I'm just gonna give you a little quick fire. One sentence answer. Oh, it's all good. Whatever's well, clever. Yeah? yeah so yeah. one sentence answer. I'll just do some f three quick questions. So what does music mean to you? Love. Great. Um, if you could only sample one artist for the rest of the time, who would it be? George Clinton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> artist are dead, dead or alive to produce for? Sorry? Artist dead or alive, the p dream person to work with? Artists dead or alive? Yeah, any artist out there, dead or alive, that you'd like to work with, who you haven't? Notorious B.I.G. Big up. Yeah, man. Yeah. What's your greatest achievement? What's your greatest achievement? Mm. Not breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> Wicked, man. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a few music students in tonight, so um, from DBS where I work. Um, so we're just going to turn out a little quick Q&A and see if we've got a few questions from the audience. Is that cool with you? That's cool. All right. Anyone? There's a chap at the front. He's sat at the front. He's got to be eager. Can you have the... Is there a mic? Here comes the mic. We can hear you, but I think they're recording. <laughs> I'm currently a fan of an artist named Bill Ray. He's an MC coming out of New York. I, I, I'm actually working with him as well. Um, but he's, I got a personal stake in his sound because I feel like New York being the mecca of hip hop has lost its sound. And I think he'll be one of the artists to help restore that sound. Um, producers, hmm. Kanye, I'm feeling Kanye, you know. I like Kanye West. Cool, man. Yep. Hey. Anyone else? That man, that man in there, my MC. <laughs> Mr. Blacksmith. Um, what's your go-to sound, What's your favorite bit of kit that you use in the shoe on a regular basis? Um, in recent days, I've been using Ableton 9. Yeah. Because um, I travel so much, and I really, I really like it. I think it's conducive to hip-hop producers and DJs, let alone it's a, it's a good tool to learn music. You know, um, I've been trying to broaden my musicianship, so I'm looking to learn music more, you know, like instead of just programming, I want to learn how to play. So Ableton has actually been helping me learn more musicianship. Um, but, you know, what I came up on, what I truly got a love for, 
the SB1200. Yeah. It, it has an undeniable sound that you can't replicate nowhere else yeah. on no other device. Yeah. All right, great. Anyone else? Let's chat here. Um, UK hip hop scene has always been great to me. Um, my my problem with UK hip hop, nobody really supports it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, for I've been around the UK scene for over twenty five years. I mean, Moni Love is my sister. You know, um, I've been a part of Ty. You know, Ty. I know MC Ty. Yeah, yeah. You know, Black Twain, I know all these, I know a yeah. lot of these cats. Um, and um, what's unfortunate is when they reach a certain success level, the audience here abandons the artist. It's like you don't really want to see the artist grow. You want to keep it pigeonholed just to the UK. Yeah. And that's, excuse my language, that's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. Really. <laughs> so... That's why you got, and, 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 it's, and it happens with, not just with hip hop, but it happened with all UK artists, because I watched the shit even happen to Loose Ends, I watched it even happen to, to, uh, to Jazzy B with Soul of Soul, I watched it to a lot, happen to a lot of UK artists, where once they reach a certain level in the mainstream, y'all abandon them, and that's why everybody go to America or wherever they go to try to get other love, because they lose the love of their own people. They need you to champion them on throughout the rest of the world. There's a big world out there, you know? And the music is meant for the world. You can't be selfish and keep it for yourself. You know, yeah. we love loose ends too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Can we share them with y'all? You know what I mean? Much as we love Moni, much as we love Ty, Black Twain, and everybody else. You know, like, there's been a lot of great stuff come here. It just need to be able to come out. Yeah, real man, good. Anyone else? She's had a hand up for a while, go on. Sorry? A British DJ that you saw, is there anyone that you would like to work with or haven't worked with? As a British DJ? This guy called Frenick over here. <laughs> you said a, a British? <laughs> <laughs> um, I like Sour Love. Y'all know DJ Sour Love? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I like to do some stuff for her. No, I think... <laughs> nah, I, 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 nah, not like that, fam. Nah. <laughs> Nah, nah, not like that. Nah, 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 nah. Y'all all, y'all, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong right there. <laughs> not like that at all. Nah, I think she's an incredible DJ, you know. Um, the contrast, I, I think it would be challenging because she's good at what she does. I'm good at what I do. And I think we have something that could be something a bit more. Like, I like bringing the contrast. It's a little bit more challenging as opposed to something that looks, you know, easy and expected. Like, me and Ali Shaheed Muhammad is something that's expected, you know. But Maceo and Sour Love is something unexpected, you know what I'm saying? So I would like to work with her on something. Cool, man. Good. Oh, one more. Go on, go for it. Shorty Blitz is another one, too. Sorry. Shorty Blitz, big up, yeah. Sorry. Huh? The girl, the girl, the girl, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Move the mic. <laughs> Next one. This one here. I've been told. Other than hip hop, uh, what sort of music do you like to listen to in your spare time? Like, what well, DJs I like to listen to in my spare time? Just music. Oh, music. Just, just music. Other than hip hop. Um, lately I've been listening to some Brazilian funk. That's what I've been checking out lately. Like I've been, I've been going through my 45s lately, so. Wow. And I went to Brazil last year, so I brought a lot of Brazilian funk. So like, I'm really all in my 45s right now with funk and soul and some disco stuff, you know? Yeah. Sick. Sorry? So he's, he's saying, like, what have you found difficult going through the music industry? Um, 
What did I find difficult going through the music industry? I mean, I mean, this is the one of the most shady businesses to be in. You know, um, I mean, once you get a good grasp of that before you get in, I, I had a good understanding of that before I got in. So it's something I have been able to throw over my shoulder for some time. Um, the minute these BS people come my way, I just move them out my way, really. I mean, I don't, I don't really have that. I mean, you know, there's a lot of definitely fake people in the business, but based on who I am as a person, somehow they're forced to be real with me or else just get out of my way, you know, period. I, I, don't, I don't care to know you if you're fake. So I don't really, I don't really have no struggles cutting through the industry. I, every situation I've been in, I've been knowledgeable of. So I, I don't have no... I mean, the best thing to, to, to do is always be on top of your business and you won't run into no issues. Cool. Was there anything that you were conscious of before you signed your first record label that made the group change to, or did you feel pressured into any situations because you were now signed artists? Um, I mean, only pressures you ever really feel after being a signed artist, uh, not even just signed, but accomplished, is um, trying to follow through with the next thing. You know, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. How, I, to, to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't know how we do it, because I always say we are, we are a freak of nature, next to the rest of the music business, and, 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 and I get the same fear as every other person in the business. The longer you away from your craft and putting material out, after you play a part of the com, the competitive part of the, biz, the business where you're putting out music and you're competing with the charts because you're significant, significantly a part of the business. But when you're away from the craft and you five years with no record, seven years with no record, eight years no record, 10 years, and the music also changes, and then you're looking to start fresh and come with a record, you know, we lost a lot of time there. The, the music changed, the style changed. How do we stay relevant? The question is, where's my relevance in a day and time where I done, I done waited a whole decade to put out some material? That's traditional with every artist. I feel blessed that somehow we've been able to supersede that somehow. You know, and I don't know the answer to it. I really don't know, because it is a scary place to be in. It's like, you know, we have this ongoing discussion, you know, you can always tell when it's over for somebody else. You can say, hmm, oh, it's, it's over for so-and-so. I don't want to say no names. <laughs> but, how do, but how do you know when it's over for you, you know? How do you can look yourself in the mirror and say, yo, I'm done, you know? Like. Especially when you don't want it to be done. I mean, as, as grimy and shady as this business is, it is, it is fun. It, especially when you overcome certain obstacles, it's fun. It's it's the best high in the world, you know. Next, better than any drug. Getting on stage, performing your music for people who can sing word for word from front to back, you know, and uh, a room full of people, 500 plus, singing all your words to your songs and and giving you that instant gratification of all the hard work you put in for the work songs you recorded, like. It's the best feeling in the world. So to know when it's over for you, it's, it's a hard, that's, that's a still a question we ask. I thought Q-Tip said it best, it said when he dies. <laughs> well, you know, some people <laughs> die before they die. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, I think we're going with the mic is, so someone at the back there with a the microphone. The most what? Just tip. Uh, Give me a tip to start a hip-hop group. To start a group? What's the biggest tip? Friendship. Yeah. First be friends. Yeah. You know, going with the same common goal to be a group. You know, don't go on with the whole idea of 
I'm going to do this and then all of a sudden get to a certain level and become a solo artist, you know? Going with the same common goal of being a group and be friends. I mean, the business of De La Soul is truly our friendship. And trust me, we go through a lot of ups and downs. Like, you know, I, don't, I can't paint no pretty picture. This, it's, it's real life. There's many times we disagreed horribly, you know, but we have the same common goal, you know, which is to be a group and preserve what we created, you know. And there's at times when, you know, human beings are human beings. Not everybody's going to be on the same page. And you always got to be patient and wait for the next person to catch up. Great answer, man. Great answer. I'm looking for the, the, the man running with the mic. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to you for coming to see all these young people. Because for people like you that bring the music back from the day, you have brought a lot of hope and joy to a lot of people. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah, that. Thank you. Appreciate it. I think that's a perfect uh, question to end on then. So can we just all stand up and just give this man a big round of applause, please? Come on. Yeah. <laughs>